up, everyone. Coincidences. Screw Apple. <laughs> hey, everybody. What's happening? Where is everybody from? I see y'all typing it in. What is the track? This is an, an Iden Essen improvisation from 1986 on a record that he never put out. That's all him improvising there, even the strings all at once. He made a record um, in one hour in New York City. He was, um, he had like 250 bucks, remember this story. He was flying back to Turkey to visit his family and um, and he said, oh, I, I stopped at um, Avatar or some studio in New York. He said, I had 250 bucks, so I recorded a record in an hour. So one hour of studio time, and this is one of the pieces. There we go. Anyways, how's everybody doing today? I don't have my glasses on. I'll sit close. I got Michelle is doing the uh, moderating. Say hey, Michelle. Hi, everyone. <laughs> That's Aiden Essen, A-Y-D-I-N-E-S-E-N. -E -E uh, let's see, a couple things. So just for the duration of this video, I've got a, uh, I always do little special sales here when I go live. I have my, my Beato book, my PDF bundle that's 68 pages. The Beato book's 300 and some odd. And then my album all together for 69 bucks, which is, uh, normally it would be $96, so just do a little inversion there of it. So uh, any of you that don't have my book or my PDF bundle, which has about, I don't know, 13, 15 different videos as a PDFs for them, and my album, which came out last week, um, Money Inversion, exactly, um, that you can get it there all at once, all three. Um, so... Michelle, there you go. Somebody said hi to you. Oh, hi, hi everyone. So I put out a video earlier today about um, about tonal harmony. Oh, before I forget, I may be coming to New York City in a couple weeks for a couple days. Uh, so my friend Aiden is going to be in the area, and I may be doing a talk in New York or a couple of them. How many people are actually from the New York area would come to see, uh, come to hang out if I did something in New York City? I'm kind of kind of curious. So um, it'd be like, yeah, well, actually, Aiden would be uh, would be playing, and I would be doing a talk beforehand. That's kind of that's what I'm thinking, anyways. I don't have anything. Um, definitely planned yet but it'll be planned here in the next couple days so um so yeah anyways i was throwing that out there um so i put out this new video today and some of you may say well why do i want to learn tonal harmony what what's the big deal about that there's so many rules to it you know i know some of you went to college and you took harmony class you know they called it 17th century counterpoint when I was in school something like that I think that was the name of the class I don't even remember they always change the name of the classes but they're they're you know it's like tonal harmony or what do they call it at Berkeley Michelle tonal harmony, tonal harmony. And, uh, counterpoint. and counterpoint right it's the same thing I mean basically it's you're, you're learning both at the same time um, so no barrel fist no metal there you go exactly uh, 
18th century counterpoint, 17th century counterpoint, exactly. It's really 18th century counterpoint because it's 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 uh, pretty much studying Bach, the rules of Bach, even though Johann Fuchs had his uh, had his treatise out that Bach owned, even though Bach didn't really follow his rules. Uh, Bach did not write any books. What he did write were the um, uh, were the two and three part inventions. He also wrote the um, um, he also wrote the Well Tempered Clavier books one and two. Those were his actual uh, treatise treatises on harmony. So, um, uh, so th there, that's kind of that that was Bach's uh, contribution to tonal harmony, and basically creating all the rules through what he wrote in his pieces. And there's a lot of rules like people don't don't understand. I didn't get into it. You can't teach tonal harmony in one class. You just can't. This is something that you actually need to do worksheets on. So, um, so that's going to be a course. I'm going to do a tonal harmony course on, on my Beato Academy of Music. But why is it important, though? Well, for a lot of reasons because. Your ability to write a strong melody and to do really strong counterpoint is would be determined by your skills as a tonal um, in writing tonal harmony and and having correct voice leading, understanding all the um, understanding all these rules and why these rules are important. You know why do why are parallel fifths? Why don't they sound good? Or why do they um, why do people say, oh, don't use parallel fifths? Well, one of the reasons is that the interval of a fifth is a very strong interval. A lot of this has to do with the combinations of intervals. Only occasionally, for example, you double the third in a major or minor chord. Okay, Occasionally, you, you double the, you'll double the third, but typically you'll double the root in the fifth. Because the third, as I explained on one of my last live streams, uh, reduces the clarity of the chord. Well, when you have parallel fifths, if you have two fifths in a row, you don't notice it. But when you're listening to a piece, if you were to hear uh, parallel fifths or parallel octaves go by, especially parallel fifths, you would start. You would notice a spot where you couldn't hear all the voices clearly. One of the things it does is that the the fifth, that fifth interval begins to mask other things that are happening. Uh, and I know Thomas Newman has tons of parallel fifths. Well, we're talking about, but Thomas Newman has a master's degree from Yale in composition. Thomas Newman knew all this stuff when he was a kid because his dad was the biggest composer in Hollywood, Alfred Newman, who wrote the 20th Century Fox theme. And, and he understands tonal counterpoint. Thomas Newman, uh, John Williams, James Newton Howard, every one of these people understand tonal counterpoint. They understand all the rules of Bach. They know part writing, they know voice leading, and when they choose to do these things, um, when they choose to get these things down, you know, to get these things, to, to when they choose to use these things, they know how to use them properly. They also know how to voice lead from chord to chord, even if, even if the chords are not part of tonal harmony, if they're doing things using atonality, there are still certain things that you do that will inform you. Like when I'm playing this thing of Iden's here, now this sounds really complex because it really is. And um, he, uh, I'll play a little bit more of it here. Now Iden learned all this, tonal counterpoint when he was six years old, eight years old, seven years old. Randy Newman's their cousin, exactly. Now, in order to improvise like this, you need to have a background in tonal music. And if I had, could, if I had to say, what is my, 
what created my success as a producer more than anything and as a songwriter, it was it's understanding these rules. People that there, there are certain people that just instinctually will follow them. Max Martin or Paul McCartney or John Lennon or, um, you know, there's pop songwriters, Kurt Cobain or Tom Petty that know how to write melodies that work with chord progressions and they know what a balanced melody is. They know, um, you know, they, they know how to put an arrangement together. But when you start to get into trying to do orchestrations and things like that, this is where it really, um, you know, once you get beyond triads and things like that, you get into inverted chords. Voice leading is extremely important, especially for how your melody speaks, how your counter melodies speak, and you just have to know it. And the unfortunate thing is that there's so many rules, as I was going through my litany of rules, that you have to know, and the only way you actually learn them is by doing worksheets. Now that sounds boring, but it is act actually incredibly useful. And I use these things all the time. I literally do. In producing, when I produce rock bands, pop bands, country music, everything. When I'm doing guitar part overdubs, when I'm doing keyboard overdubs, I am constantly thinking of what is the melody, what are the harmony parts, what are the inner voices doing? Okay, you want to find things that that move by, you know, the, the that uh, stepwise motion is incredibly important. You know, think ideas like what goes up by skip comes down by step. These are things that writing a great melody, they actually follow these principles. You can analyze hit songs and these hit songs will actually follow these counterpoint principles. So... Um, do you think learning the rules, you lose the heart in it? No. Be here's why. Because once you learn these rules and you start doing it, you just hear that way. So um, so there's no, you don't think about the rules. It's kind of like, do you think about, um, uh, what would be, you know, do you have to look up every word when you're reading a book? No. When you're reading a book, Every word is a sight word. Occasionally, if you're reading some technical manual or something, we're using some scientific terms or something like that, you might have to look up a word. But generally, if there's a word that you've never heard, you can actually deduce what it is by the context of where it, where it is. So um, that is kind of the, the, the idea here, is that hearing it will say, oh, that doesn't sound good. For example, I talked about in pop writing that you rarely hear the sixth in a melody. If I have an A major chord, right? And you think about, okay, what am I gonna sing on this here? Well, bum, bum, bum. So I've got those three notes which are safe, right? The three notes of the chord, A, C sharp, and E. Okay, what are other good notes? Da, da. That could work, or da. Lydian, sharp four, right? Okay, what about this note, though? Da. Okay, the sixth. When you have a sixth in the melody over a major chord, da. it sounds really square, okay? Not only does it sound square, and one of the reasons it sounds square is that, um, square, that's like an old, old man term there. It doesn't sound powerful. It's not like one of these notes. It's not like, if I'm going to use a note outside the triad, da, that's sus too. Da, or da, or da. Um, but this, actually that sounds good because I played the sharp four after it. Now, if I harmonize it with the sharp four, uh, that's one possibility. But if it's a tonic chord, right? Uh, if you're in the key of A, that F sharp is the third of the four chord. That is why it doesn't, why, it doesn't really...
because that that note is the third of the four chord, it actually gives away the sound of the four chord. So typically you don't find sixths in melodies a lot. You'll hear a lot of sus fours, you'll hear sharp fours, you'll hear nines. I'm talking in popular music. You hear it in gent. You hear a lot of sus twos, you know. Uh, you'll hear on minor chords, you'll hear, you might hear the sixth on a minor chord. That's a different animal there. If I have a minor chord and it's, uh, you know, that would be the sixth. And that's, but really because of the spacing of it, this chord, I'm making that sixth actually have a really cool sound. So, um, but typically, the sixth is a really weak note because it doesn't harmonize well and it's not a strong melody note. You rarely hear them in pop music. And guys like Max Martin just intuitively avoid those notes. If they do sing it, you'll hear, they'll hear the sixth will resolve down to the fifth, okay? It has, a, it has I wouldn't say it has a strong resolution tendency, but it, you want to hear that fifth if you're going to use it because it's part of the pentatonic scale. But there's really another structural reason for this. The structural reason is that it's the furthest note in the overtone series from the tonic, okay? If you take a chord, if you take a bass note like A, and you start building thirds, what's the first third you get? You get C sharp, E, G sharp, B, right? And then you could go D sharp. There's your Lydian sound. And then, or you could do with a sus four, you go. That 13th, it's called the 13th for a reason. If you start an A and play an A major scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. It's that note is the furthest note away in the overtone series from the tonic, okay? That is why it sounds weak. So um, if you do the overtone series using the major scale um, and you get to the 11th, right? And I go one, three, five, seven, nine. If I go to the 11, that's, that's, I mean, it can sound good, the sus4 or the 11, but this, the Lydian, the sharp4, really is a strong note, okay? So, uh, that is one of the reasons why that note doesn't sound good in melodies on pop songs. These are one of the things that you realize when you get into learning tonal harmony. Another thing you do... One of the ways around these rules to make them work so that you don't have parallel fifths, a lot of things that, that people would do, like Bach, would you start having suspensions. This is where all these great chords came in, the sus chords, the Lydian chords, you know, all this stuff. They became, uh, because of voice leading and people avoiding these uh, parallel fifths, parallel octaves, any of these odd uh, uh, interval things that you want to avoid in your part writing, they would start doing things to avoid them by putting in suspensions and then resolving them on the next beat so those parallel fifths wouldn't be next to each other, okay? And then people would start taking those out of context and using them as chords. Does that make sense? So this is really how these kind of modern uh, chords developed. For example, there's a chord, if you take the first chord in a, in a, a Bach cantata number 54, that um, there's an incredible, I've mentioned this before, there's an incredible um, video of Glenn Gould conducting an orchestra doing this, um, he does this talk where he starts out playing an organ, he's talking, and then he talks for about seven or eight minutes and he walks across this what you realize is a soundstage and there's an orchestra sitting there just waiting. 
and he walks by this piano and he continues on. He talks about that he's that he, he says he's going to play this Bach piece, cantata number 54. And they have a countertenor named Russell, Russell Ober, uh, o, uh, Oberlin that, that sings. Countertenor is basically a tenor that sings in such a high range that it sounds like an alto. Okay? And... He, he, Glenn Gould goes on to explain that the first chord in this Bach piece is one that is probably the most, one of the most complex in all of Bach's music. And nobody really wrote any voicings like this until, you know, 150 years later, at least 100 years later, probably, probably more like 150 years later. And um, it starts in E flat and it goes like this. And it's, da, 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 da. it's how the melody starts. But that chord right there is a, well, it's E flat, F, A flat. So E flat, F, A flat, B flat, D. So what is that chord? Well, if you look at it and you say, okay, it's kind of a B flat seven chord. I see this part. That would be a B-flat 7 in second inversion with an F in the bass. So F, A-flat, B-flat, D, right? You've got... But you have an inversion. But you have the E-flat in the bass, okay, which is the sus4. Um, somebody mentioned Jeswaldo, which is actually true. I mean, Jeswaldo, he's one of the few people that did... And I'm going to do a video on Jeswaldo that did these really dissonant chords in the uh, Renaissance era when people were doing more modal music. Anyways, so this particular chord here, this e, B flat seven sus four over E flat is really the first chord in the piece. And it is absolutely beautiful. And the piece is just suspension after suspension. And it's, it's just, one of the most beautiful pieces. Look up the YouTube video after you watch my my tonal harmony video, or you go to my store and you uh, and don't forget to download my my. Um, I did this arrangement for my new tonal harmony video. Uh, I did it for a chamber orchestra, just four pieces. It's like a string quartet, but with a chamber orchestra. And I took a chorale into four voices, but I wrote it for violin one, violin two, viola, and cello, okay? And um, I have the score there you can download for free. Um, and I see that there's 526 people on here and 143 likes. There should be at least about 600 likes. I figure that, you know. Anyway, so, um, so this particular Bach piece, write this down, Glenn Gould. If you, if you type in Glenn Gould Bach, um, Maybe Michelle, you can find it. It's a black and white video. Is Glenn Gould plays Bach. Just Glenn Gould. Just write, type in Glenn Gould Bach, and maybe you can. Did you find it? That's it. Wait, no, no, no. That's not it. That's not it. No, no. Just play Ben Glenn Gould Bach, and then you can paste it in the comments here, and people can get it. Oh, so cantata number fifty-four. It's the second one down there. It's a. It's that. Uh, no, no, no. Right. You just went past it. Right at the top. Right there, right there, right there, the black and white one. No, one up, one above. Hit that. Which one? Let's see if this is it here. Hold on. Yeah, this, this. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So, uh, so grab that uh, URL, and so Michelle's gonna paste the URL for the uh, for the Glenn Gould. I'm not sure if I can actually paste the URL here. You can't. Yeah. Okay. Well, just type in. What did you type in, Glenn? What's what's it titled? Okay. Just, t just write in the title of it. Um, so the only chat where no one donates because musicians are poor. That's awesome. That's actually not awesome. Musicians shouldn't be poor. Musicians are incredibly important. Uh, they should be paid more than anything. Russell Oberlin, there you go. Cantata number 54. The piece begins uh, about nine and a half minutes into it, but you should really listen to, to what Glenn Gould says about Bach before. The piece, he talks about the title and some of the lyrics is Stand Firm Against Sin is the uh, translation from German. Although, I don't know if that's really true. I need to ask Aaron if, it's, if, that's, if that's a proper translation of it. But... Um, 
um, when you're watching it, n note what Glenn Gould is playing at the keyboard because he's doing the continuo part. He's actually playing, he's actually improvising the harpsichord part, but he's doing it on a piano that sounds like a harpsichord. But watch what he's playing. It's really, and listen to what he's playing. It's fascinating. He's conducting, but he's actually playing the figured bass, I believe. Um, and he's just doing it by ear. So, um, and when he's talking about the piece, he actually demonstrates that chord. Ba, 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 ba. And he's, he plays it. And then he plays the da, 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 da. He plays the main theme to it, just like the orchestra plays it. So, um, um, I, we have enough Germans in the room to translate it, but I can't. I don't know how to say it in German. What the title of it is, but it's cantata number fifty-four. If you look it up, you'll uh, you'll know. You can find out what the what the actual title is. I mean, Glenn Gould said it's it's. Uh, it's uh, he he translates it himself, but I don't, I'm not sure he's a he was a German speaker. So, anyways, um, so these this is the reason why you want to learn this because this will teach you so much about writing any type of music. If you are, um, if if you're a jazz musician and you're voicing chords and you're playing a standard, if you're a rock musician, if you're an EDM. Uh, if you're doing if you're doing some you know dance track and you want to have you know some cool voice leading in your inner voices as you're in Ableton and you're dragging your MIDI notes around, this you can use these same principles because voice leading is voice leading and you learn about voice leading through learning tonal harmony. So, anyways, that's that's why that's important. Check out my video on it. Um, I think that um, uh, it, it would take probably about, uh, I'd say probably 10 to 12 videos to really teach it properly with, with worksheets. But one of the issues, and I was talking to, I think I was talking, was I talking to you, this, uh, Michelle, about one of the issues with this? Or, um, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday. One of the problems with when you're teaching, you're talking about teaching figured bass and things like that, and and actually, you know, you have a cantus firmus or a melody that you're harmonizing, and you can harmonize it many different ways. So you actually have to have a teacher to look it over. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's the that is actually the only issue with it. I can teach you all the rules. I can show you what to do, but when you're doing it yourself, you need somebody to check your work. So you were talking to. To Yashar yesterday. Yeah, I was talking to Yashar. Yeah, so you need you actually need someone to check your work. That's the problem uh, of it, to make sure that you don't have, you know, any hidden fifths or octaves or that your voice leading is really sound. You don't have too big of space between voices. You don't want to have an octave space between the, the alto and the soprano. Um, you know, you don't want to have any weird leaps in two instruments at the same time. When I say leaps, I mean, you know, if you're jumping a fourth or something like that, there's weird interval jumps. Uh, you don't want to have a bunch of parallel motion. And you might not realize these things because some of these things can be hidden. And um, um, so HK, did you see that? Look at that. That was, that was so awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Last time you gave me... Um... Michelle's still yeah. still drinking the uh, coffee that that you bought her last time. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so um, so that's that's why this is really important. You know, I started a series on post tonal harmony too because there's you know there's tonal harmony and then if you were to put a bunch of my videos together, I kind of talk about things. Uh, th th this is this is funny because I said yesterday when I was making the video. I said to Aaron was here and I said, um, yeah, I'm going to put this um, video link to this video on on uh, figured bass. He said, you did a video on figured bass? I said, oh, yeah, it was way, way back, right when I first started the channel. And I said, nobody really watched it, so I hid it um, because I thought it was so out of context at the time 
there were no other videos like it. So I was like, oh, who's going to, who's going to ever, nobody watched the video. I had to, you know, a couple thousand views. So I had to make this video. When I made this video, I was like, oh, well, I need to talk about figured bass. Well, I've already made a video of that. Where is it? And he's like, I've never seen that video. I said, yeah, it's hidden. So I have it here. And then I linked it. And I did, when I first uploaded the video this morning, I forgot to put the link in there, but I put it in the description. So uh, you should also go check out my figured bass video because that's also important in understanding this because I talk about the symbols that you see. And I mean, a lot of you will know these symbols. If you see a one six chord, then you will know that a, you know, a six chord... Um, I'll come back to that question, but I, I didn't see that. You can tell me what it is, Michelle, right? Um, like a 1-6 chord means it's a first inversion chord. So um, uh, a like a 5-6-5 five, five chord, these things refer to what inversion you're in. If you're in a 1-6-4, it's a second inversion major chord, uh, you know, second inversion tonic chord. Um, so watch the figured bass video because it's kind of, they, they actually go together, okay? You can watch the, uh, it doesn't matter what order you watch them in because you're not going to learn all tonal harmony from watching one video. But download my PDF, print it out on a printer, get your pencil out, and start looking at the voice leading. I provided the harmonic analysis to it, meaning... I, it starts in G major, it starts on the one chord, and then it goes to a, I don't know, a first inversion four chord or something. Is that what it goes to, Michelle? I can't remember the Bach, the Bach thing. But the first cadence in the, in the chorale is on B major, okay? So he's gone to a uh, really kind of a chromatic median modulation there, but he's, he's going to the, uh, to the five of six chord, okay? The five, seven, of, it's not really five, seven of six, it's five of six. Because I think it was just a straight B major triad. But Bach, within two bars, he's gone from G major to B major, which was super sophisticated and could only have been done at that time if you had a well-tempered instrument. You could never do those kind of um, modulations until you had equal temperament. Okay, there was a question that, that Tony had or something. Was yeah. that? What was the so question? Can you, uh, so can you do something on your website where... We send our sheets and you correct our harmony. So they can send... Like, yeah, I'm not sure how you could send them, though. Um, um, we'll take that into consideration. Yeah, I'd have to figure out. I could yeah. do something like that. I have to figure out how to do it. I'm not sure how you could send. You know, some people po have posted things. I think there... Isn't there a way to post links where you just post a... You can put a link... In a, um, is that how they do it? They do a Google Drive link where, where you, link and then yeah, where I, I think you guys can just post the link. Of course, everyone else can see it. I guess you could private message me on YouTube if you don't want other people to see your work, but maybe you do want people to see your work. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that's probably the, actually the easiest way. And, uh, but I'll, um, and it's up, I'll set it up. Who said that, Aaron? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, perfect. There you go. Yeah, the things need to be looked at. And most of the stuff is, if you have a, you know, you can do these things and really, you can do really short four bar, you know, harmonization of a, uh, of a, of a cantus firmus, of a melody. And uh, you'll have the figured bass in the bottom and then you just, or you, you do the, uh, the correct voice leading and part writing to it. Uh, but like I said, it needs to get checked and, the things can get checked really quickly. You know, I can look at it and say, oh, he's got, you know, that's, oh, this should do contrary motion here, you know. But the thing is that there's actually a lot of possibilities. So it's not like there's any one right answer, which is why um, you need to have a teacher teach you this stuff. This is actually why in the old days, meaning before there was, you know, the internet, no, I'm talking before there was electricity. Um, Bach had a... Um, or Beethoven had a, uh, who was you, Yashar, saying yesterday? Um, there, was a, there was a patron that had a music library that Beethoven used to go visit all the time. And he had scores of the well-tempered clavier and the Goldberg variations. And Beethoven would take these scores and would study them. And a lot of times they would, uh, Muddy Waters invented electricity. Jari, that's good. I like that. 
Um, so he would go and he would either copy these things by hand, maybe the whole piece, maybe sections of the piece, or just read them and memorize them. But he could hear them. I mean, Mozart, they, you know, a lot of these musicians at the time couldn't afford their own scores, but they had people that actually had libraries that would have scores in them. And they would study them. And this is how they would learn counterpoint. They would typically learn, and Bach would have his kids copy down parts, okay? If he's writing a cantata for the Sunday service, uh, you know, and he's doing one every week, Monday they would get the, uh, I forget what, what they, what they would put together all their staff paper, okay? They'd have to make their staff paper, get it all ready, get all their materials ready. I mean, there's a lot of production that would go on if you didn't, couldn't go to your, you know, local guitar center and buy a book of staff paper or wherever you buy it at, you know, your local music store. We have a music store here in Atlanta that I go to that actually sells real, you know, books on music. And uh, so you go there, you buy it, and then you can write it and everything. Well, they had to actually prepare all this stuff, okay? So you prepare all your things and you write the piece. Bach would do his preparations on Monday. He'd write the pieces on Tuesday and Wednesday. Thursday, he would have, uh, you know, rehearsals, Thursday and Friday. And, uh, you know, in the midst of all this stuff, he was teaching private lessons. But his kids would be copying out parts, and that that's how he would teach them about voice leading. He would have them copy out pieces of his, you know, and um, and they would learn what to do uh, from that. And nobody really does that anymore. So this is, um, and he would check the things at the time to make sure that they had the proper voice leading. Oh, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do this. Would sound better here. Change the melody here. You need to have a perfect authentic cadence. I mean, we haven't even gotten into the different cadences there are. And I know a lot of you know them. You'll know the term plagal cadence and authentic cadence and perfect authentic and imperfect authentic. I mean, there's all these different cadences that you need to know as well. So um, which book do I recommend on harmony? Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of different books on harmony. Um, um, you know, what's interesting is, is that I, um, all my books on harmony disappeared um, um, I was storing them. This is, this is a true story. I was storing them with a very dear friend of mine in New York city when I lived in New York before I moved to Atlanta. And I had probably, I had many, many orchestral scores, all this stuff. This is my friend, Roger and Roger got ill with cancer. He was 51 years old. This was in, um, Oh Jesus, probably seven, eight years ago now. And he, died in three months. Um, and my scores were there at his place and I don't know what happened to him. I probably had a couple thousand dollars in scores. I mean, I didn't, I don't care. All my harmony books, everything. I've, I've rebought a few books. Um, I have a, uh, a great orchestration book that I, that I had here last night. Where is it here? I've got, I've got a bunch of books, but I haven't rebought any of my um, it didn't it wasn't there an orchestration book around here yeah. that Kent Kennan book because I thick one, right? yeah the thick one I found it in the um, is that it yeah thanks this is a great book here the technique of, the technique of orchestration it's got a horrendously bad cover on it it didn't used to have a bad cover it used to have a nice green cover like the Vincent Persichetti book. But this book came out in um, 1952, and it's an excellent book on orchestration. It's one of the best. Uh, Schoenberg's books, um, all of his books are good. Um, but this book I really, really like. This isn't a book on counterpoint, but I'm just saying that this is one of the books that I that I rebought years years later. But I don't know what happened to my um, to my books on harmony. But uh, um, who's the author of that book? Kent Kennan. Um, I think there's two different authors. Maybe it was re-edited. Um, oh, Donald Grantham. Okay. This is uh, from the University of Texas at Austin. But this book, 1952, it's an excellent book in or uh, on orchestration. It's one of the best books. It's called 
the technique of orchestration. Uh, but there's, you know, there's, there's, there's the Rimsky-Korsakoff book. There's, there's, some, there's some good books on orchestration. They don't necessarily cover what, um, uh, they don't necessarily cover things that, um, you know, being written in 1952, it had been up, you know, it's been updated, I believe, but um, it, uh, you know, I think that there's room for, for another great orchestration book. I have a friend in Amsterdam that actually is, is writing a book on orchestration, who's a, who's a composer, he's a very good composer, great composer. And uh, he's doing a book on orchestration that he's been working on, so uh, there might be a new one out soon. Uh, Neapolitan six chord baffles your logic. Well, I happen to have a video on Neapolitan six chords and and um, and augmented six chords. So go look up in my um, go through my videos. You see, I always have people saying, "Oh, okay, you should do a video on this." I'm like, "Yeah, I've already done three videos on that." Or why don't you do a video on this? So I did a video on Neapolitan six chords. It's called, I think it's called something like Augmented Six Chords and Neapolitan Six Chords. Michelle, can you look this up and see? Uh, I can't remember. I've made, so many, I've made like 360 videos, something like that, including this one. This is another video I'm making. Um, so that particular video, oh, how many people here haven't subscribed to my channel, by the way? Because literally, um, hey, hey to Russia. Literally, um, um, 69% of people that watch my videos don't subscribe to my channel, believe it or not. And that's, it's, it's amazing. Um, how many people here haven't subscribed to my channel? I, I, I act like somebody's stepfather, Michael. Um, do you like, I can't read that. Wait, do I construct chords by physics, math? I, 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 I can't read what, he's, what that says there. Um, so wait, did you find the video, Michelle? I'm looking for it right now. It's called Augmented Six Chords, I think. I can't remember the title, but the, the, the video is about Augmented Six Chords and Neapolitan Chords. And I did the video, Dylan might be in it or something. Um, I, I, I specifically did the video for college students, and I'll tell you why. Because the way that they teach augmented six chords in college um, made it so no one ever remembered what they were. Okay? Neapolitan chords, the same thing. And so I made it like a cheat sheet for people that are taking theory one or theory two, whenever you learn it in college. And you can watch this video and say, oh... I know how to figure these out. So, um, understanding augmented sixth and Neapolitan six chords. Is that what the title is? Somebody just put that in there. It might be what the title is. I wasn't very good with my titles in the past. I'm still not that good. Um, uh, subscribe, I'll be asking you to like the video. No, I ask you to like the video anyways. Um, like this video here. Um, so, um, uh, so anyways, yeah, so that particular video, if you're a student, if you don't, if you don't remember, if you took theory and don't remember what augmented six chords are, it explains it in a much simpler way than they teach it, okay? If you did study theory or are currently studying theory, um, it'll be, a, it's like a, I don't want to say a cheat sheet, but I... I teach them in a way that is very easy to remember the formulas so that you'll be able to get through your course and not, um, and not, um, do I tag the subject and not, and not get lost and know that you're going to get it right. Um, you took theory 40 years ago. Is that John? Yeah, I, I know me too. Almost 40 years ago. Do I tag the subjects in my videos? I do tag them. You know, honestly, when I, when I did my early videos, um, I think that before Aaron got here, which was about four months ago, I didn't even know really how to tag videos properly. As a matter of fact, all my videos were under, enter, were under education, not under music. So my channel would have grown much better if my videos were under music. And I changed them all to music, and all of a sudden my channel blew up. 
a few like in the last couple months after I changed uh, changed my tag or my subject matter of my videos to music because if you looked up music on YouTube you wouldn't find my videos ever which I know is really kind of ridiculous right uh, so Aaron taught me how to properly tag the videos because I would only put in a couple tags so I need to go back to some of these videos and actually tag them uh, when you have in the title, like if I say Film Scoring 101, that's why if you type in Film Scoring, my videos come up first on YouTube. And certain things that I, you know, with music theory and things like that, they come up in the first page of any search um, of these topics, really because the first two words in your title are the most important and they kind of determine the, the, you know, but but there's also the tags and they also have these, I guess, spiders or whatever that crawl through and look at your um, look at your descriptions to see what your video is about. Uh, so, oh, so let me say it again. I've got a deal going on during this. I might extend it. I might keep this video on. Actually, I was thinking about taking this. Want People want me to keep the video on. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll keep this video on. Um, okay, so so you look at somebody just posted it. Donald just posted the video. I guess you can post things in here. Oh uh, no, they uh, they have to change like the dot into like D-O-T, so like kind of like... Is that right? Yeah. I just saw one come up on here. Oh, but this won't stay until after the uh, thing. But I'll post it. I'll put it in the um, in the description here after. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll link to it here, and I'll put a... Maybe I'll put a card or something where, where I'm talking about it. Um, you can't. Okay, there you go. You can't, Jacob said. So, um, so I've got a deal going on for those of you that don't have the Beato book or my, my PDF bundle that's 68 pages or my album where I bundled them all together for how many dollars off? It's $69, right? It's normally 96 bucks for all of them, 69 bucks. Did an inversion there. <laughs> I did negative harmony, negative <laughs> monetary harmony on it. Um, well, I have Jacob Collier on Sunny Off one day. I've written to Jacob, I never heard back from him, but I only wrote to him one time. And if he's anything like me, which I'm thinking, I'm sure he's busier than me, um, what is a Beato book? Someone asked. Beato book is my book that basically helps you understand all my videos. It starts out with basic theory of intervals and then how to build chords and then what chords come from what scales. And then it's a book on harmony and improvisation, basically. Um, how about getting Trevor Horn? No one has ever asked me to get Trevor Horn. Trevor Horn would be great. As a matter of fact, I saw an interview with Trevor Horn that was really good, and I can't remember where it was. He was really very interesting, uh, and he would actually be a great guest. He's a producer, for those of you that don't know. Have you ever heard of Trevor Horn or not, Michelle? Yeah. Yeah, he's a Brit uh, British producer. Um, Someone asked, um... Where can you get the Beato book? Oh, on my website, www.rickbeato.com. Discount on just the PDF bundle? Uh, discount on just the PDF bundle? Well, maybe I'll do a discount on the Beato book itself. Um, I don't know. I could. I could make one. We'll see. Check back. Um, how do I look so young? What do you mean look young? I, I'm 55. Okay, so I'm thinking about growing my beard back. But no. it's going to be a... Michelle says no. My wife says no. Um, <laughs> anybody ever seen my... Um, my beard. Uh, oh, so I have a Twitter uh, account and I have a. Oh, I got a lot of comments right away. Oh my god. Instagram. What? But people don't yes, want me to no, see. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Beard Squad. If anybody seen my my beard on uh, Instagram. On Instagram, check out my beard on Instagram. Um. Instagram. Here, I'll show you my beard. But it, but you have to keep in mind that my beard will be white so check it out here <laughs> that's me and my daughter Layla okay so imagine that um somebody's like no wait I got a worse one than that or, or a better one than that hold on where is it here I was going to tell my wife on the phone today and uh and then I thought maybe I better not but I didn't I started yesterday's video, if you watch the video, the Tonal Harmony video, I start out early in the day making it, and uh, by night I was like, man, I need to shave. 
Um, but here's a, let's see, I got another great picture of it. Um, so I let it grow for 11 months and two days, and then I shaved it off. I couldn't quite get to a year because um, uh, my wife complained so much about it. She really, really hated it. It freaked people out. Oh, here's, here it was in, in its glory. Look at this. <laughs> Anyways, but it's going to look like that, but be white. Looks stuck on, right, exactly. Um, so, but it used to freak people out when they'd see me and Layla, my daughter, who's got blonde hair, um, when she was a baby and I'd carry her around that, um, that, that, to see that beard and, and her was always kind of a scary, scary thing. Um, anyways, yeah, I know I'm going to look like Santa Claus. My my daughter Lennon said, "Daddy, your 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 tummy's almost as big as Santa Claus's." And I said, "Thanks, Lennon. Appreciate that." Uh, anyways, all right. So, oh yeah, here's the other. This is the one with me and Layla. Here, I got one more beard picture for you. Look at that. That's some. That was great. I used to love having that. Anyway, so I might I might I might grow it for a uh, for a little bit. Okay, so video just on inversion. A video on inversions. Um, that's kind of interesting. A video on inversions. Well, I talk about inversions a lot. But um, what was the orchestration? The new orchestration book you mentioned. Oh, it's my friend Tom. I'm gonna have Tom on um, on my um, on signing off. You guys should meet Tom. He's an excellent. He's a really great composer. He has a record that he put out, a guitar record that's phenomenal. Um, I need, uh, yeah, I need to, uh, need to definitely have him on. Perfect beard, no dissonances. <laughs> um, more videos on tonal harmony. Okay, that's coming up. Um, invert your beard. You should invert your beard. Anyways, Ted Green thoughts. I love Ted Green. Negative Harmony, please. I kind of did a Negative Harmony video, Baden-Powell. Um, I did a Negative Harmony video, but I called it something else. Somebody said, oh, you did a Negative Harmony video. I forget what I called it, though. Um, anyways, all right. Go check out my website. Get the Beato book. Uh, buy my record. But you should take advantage of this deal I have here. It's a great deal. Um, thanks everybody for watching. Hit the like button here. And, uh, and those of you that haven't subscribed, subscribe. Cause, um, because it's, uh, cause it'd be great to have you subscribed and hit the notification button so that you know when I'm coming on live. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. You guys rock. Bye.